Well, thank you all for being there. And uh, let me start by apologizing that I'm not uh, in feeling person to make this presentation. Unfortunately, my flight got cancelled and I'm stranded in London until tomorrow. So, this paper is joint work with Roman Indust and it's on building on financial flexibility. So, when Roman and I started thinking about this paper, we were intrigued by some recent empirical evidence showing that the best well-known theories known to us on financial contracting, such as the pecking order theory or even, the, if, you, even if you want the trade-off theory, do not seem to perform that well as the focus shifts towards smaller firms. So Roman and I started thinking about what it, what it is, what is it that makes smaller firms different than large firms, and an immediate question is that smaller firms often don't have such a good access to a competitive market for capital. Now, another thing that is uh, another thing which has uh, also been some uh, has been in the discussion lately is that firms uh, very often try to build up financial flexibility. So what Roman and I try to do in this paper is we look at uh, we try to we propose a model of a firm building up financial flexibility by explicitly taking into account that such firm may not have an access may not have access to a competitive market for capital. Thereby we show when the pecking order theory or the theory holds and it fails to hold. And what we really uh, what we really want to focus on with these papers is uh, on the countervailing incentives generated by the initial capital structure. Countervailing incentives because there will be countervailing to those countervailing to those uh, those that are typically analyzed in the financial contracting literature. And I'll try to argue in this presentation that uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, that the initial capital structure over the countervailing incentives that it generates gives the management a very powerful tool to manage financial flexibility. Thereby, I'll show, I'll show you that we have contrasting implications depending on whether the firm has access to a competitive or to a non-competitive market for capital. The key implications that we have in mind are on how firms should build up their target ca capital structure and then how they should uh, deviate from this target on if they're pressed to raise financing or short notice, possibly facing a problem of uh, asymmetric information. And when we take our model more literally, we'll have something to say about startup financing and new firm financing. So let me now be now a bit more specific on what uh, on what countervailing incentives are and how they're generated by an initial capital structure. Now, if you think about a firm that approaches a new round of financing, now this firm, in, m in most cases, will have already an existing business, and not only an existing business, but also existing uh, existing uh, investors with outstanding claims on the on the firm's cash flows. So now, if the firm wants to claim that it is really, really good, so that uh, so that the new round of financing is uh, is gonna really boost its prospects, we have to take into account that if uh, the firm doesn't receive a new round of financing, most probably it's uh, well, most probably not gonna perform that well, but it's most probably also not gonna die, at least not necessarily gonna die. So what we really need to take into account are the outside options of the firm not only of the firm but also of the firm's investors and what is really what is really important that these outside options are going to be better the better the firm currently is so if you think about a situation where you want to convince your existing investors uh, to get to, to to give you a new round of financing or you perhaps even convince new or new investors to give you a new round of financing you have to make sure that this new round of financing gonna get gonna get uh, gonna make the existing investors, including the management, better off than not refinancing the firm. And the thing now is that if you if you want to claim to your uh, new investors or to your initial investors from which you want to obtain capital that uh, refinancing the firm is really gonna boost his prospects and it's really gonna and it's, and it's gonna be really really good, so that you're able to get cheaper financing. Now, if you really want to claim that the firm is so good, at the same time you're gonna that you you're, you're also gonna claim that the existing uh, the existing contracts are worth a lot, which would argue it would make it very expensive to convince uh, the existing uh, the existing investors, including also the management, uh, to uh, to opt for this uh, new round of financing unless it's compensated accordingly. Of course, we can also have the opposite uh, case where the management will actually have an incentive to claim that it's a bad firm. 
And in fact, I'll be talking about this uh, this case in this presentation. But then the initial capital structure and the existing contracts will provide a countervailing incentive to uh, to a countervailing incentive that actually the firm to claim that the firm is actually not that bad. Now I'll be more uh, specific and uh, I'll talk in more detail about this countervailing incentive in this presentation. But uh, but what I really want to state at this point is that these incentives are going to help reduce inf investment inefficiency. Uh, be it in the form of overinvestment or in the form of underinvestment. So in our implementation idea for this, uh, for how to implement uh, this simple idea of uh, countervailing incentives is actually very simple. It is sufficient to look at a very simple two-period uh, problem where at the initial financing stage, uh, financing is raised on the symmetric information and then at the later round, financing is raised on the asymmetric information. And by showing, uh, by, by solving this model, our key comparative analysis is basically to play with the bargaining power at the interim stage. We focus on two cases. In the first case, the bargaining power is going to be with, uh, is gonna, bargaining power is going to be with the initial investors or with the new investors, basically the investors providing the new round of financing. We also look at the opposite case where uh, where the bargaining power is uh, rather in the hands of the uh, of the of the management of the existing management, it, even when it's uh, forced to raise capital on the asymmetric information. That's actually basically the case that it's been uh, most often uh, uh, that's more most often modeled in the literature. Well, let me start with the first case. Our result there is that when the bargaining power is with uh, with with the new investor, so it's actually the investor being able to able to dictate the terms of financing. Our result is that the firm is actually going to try to preserve equity capacity. This means that, say, if you think about a startup firm or a young firm, uh, when uh, well, if such a firm uh, approaches, uh, if such a firm uh, tries to uh, uh, tries to uh, raise capital, then it will initially promise away preferred liquidation rights to its investors. And only at later stages will it actually switch to more junior uh, forms of financing, such as equity. Now, if, if you think about uh, building up a target capital structure, then uh, basically we predict that uh, firms that don't have access to very good access to competitive market for capital, such as small firms, well, such firms will pursue a high target leverage when they raise financing when they're not under duress. And they'll only switch to equity financing, basically going to deviate from this high target capital structure, uh, t target leverage, only when they're pressed to raise financing uh, at short notice, and when they're not able to divulge uh, possibly information asymmetries between them and uh, new investors. We also look at the opposite case, so when, uh, when the firm uh, is able to raise uh, financing at competitive terms, even at short notice, and then we have the opposite result. We have shown that the firm should actually avoid debt-like financing or should avoid promising preferred liquidation rights to the investors uh, when there is no pressure from, uh, from outside investors or so when it's, uh, when it's uh, raising financing for the long term. And only if it uh, needs to raise capital at short notice when it cannot bridge an information gap between, uh, between the management and its, uh, its new investor will it actually uh, up for that finance financing, thereby uh, following in a way the so-called packing order theory. So now let me briefly now sketch the model, and I'll be very brief on that because in what follows I'm actually not try not gonna force any formulas on you. I'm just gonna do a lot of hand waving, uh, trying to convey the main intuition. So we're thinking about a firm that uh, raises capital in two periods, in period one and two, to invest into a project whose payoffs are realized in the final period, period three. There is no discounting, there is uh, everybody's risk neutral. And for this pre presentation, and in fact also for the main body of the paper, we look at uh, simply at two ca at cash flow realization. So the cash flows can be either high or they can be low. Now, for those of you who work with financial contracting models, yes, uh, they should, this, you should be aware, uh, I, I'm sure that you're aware that given the right assumptions, we, all the results actually will, be, uh, will extend also to continuum of cash flows. And, uh, and to, uh, we show how to do this in, uh, also we, uh, we explain also how to do this in the, in the paper. So we focused on standard securities uh, that, and we imposed some standard assumptions such as that, uh, such as the security is monotone and that both parties are protected by limited liability. The both parties being the management, so the owner manager on the one hand and the investors on the other hand. 
So what is really new about this? Uh, so what is new about this setting is that the success probability of the project depends on two factors. It depends on uh, on the state in which the firm it, it currently is. So it can be a good or a bad state, and it also depends on whether the firm receives refinancing or not. So if the firm is in a good state, then uh, its success probability is higher, regardless of whether it has received refinancing or not. And what refinancing does, it, is always, it always increases the probability of success as well. Thereby we, and thereby we assume that uh, refinancing in the good state is at least as efficient as refinancing in the bad state. So what is really key for our model is that uh, initially there is symmetric information. So uh, the probability of being in a good or a bad state is just some common, no is common knowledge and there is some uh, distribution over it, which is uh, over, the, over, over this probability, which is uh, known to everybody. But in this interim period and period two, the, uh, the, the owner manager becomes privately informed about the true probability that the firm ends up in the good, uh, in the good state. Now we're going to assume that it's uh, that uh, refinancing is pro profitable only in the good state, implying that there is going to be a cutoff uh, type or cutoff probability, so that it's efficient to refinance uh, firms which uh, which only have a probability of being in the good state above a certain uh, threshold, which we def uh, denote with Q first best. Now, before before I present uh, the main uh, results in more detail, let me state uh, let me state up front that if we could write a contract committing both parties to refinancing terms already in the initial period, period, then uh, we'll not have any investment inefficiencies, and uh, basically there is going to be no interesting uh, case for financial contracting. So what we really want to focus on with this paper is a situation in which such contracts are not uh, renegotiation proof. And uh, we're actually very explicit how to uh, how to endogenize this in the paper. Now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that, but it's all in the paper, and I encourage you to to have a look if uh, if you're interested how we do that. And in fact, the way we endogenize uh, the, the the way we endogenize uh, this uh, at least for now assumption, is this uh, this also finds uh, this also resonates in our empirical implications. So what we really want to focus on is a sequence of contractual gain, games, raising, uh, raising financing in period one, and then raising financing in period two. Here I'm going to look at uh, the simplest possible case where the financing is raised from the initial investor, and thereby the old, and thereby the old co contracts are going to be replaced for new ones. But uh, we also in the, in the paper we also extend, extend our results to financing from investors. Now, as I, mentioned, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have we're looking at two cases. In the first case, uh, the, the investor, the, um, in the first case, the management will, will not, the owner manager will not have access to a competitive market for capital, and in the second case, the management will face a competitive market for capital even when he has to raise financing under asymmetric information. Now, I'm, in this presentation, I'm only going to focus on the first case because it's uh, it's going to give us the main idea about how counterweighting incentives work, and it's also, I think, uh, the more interesting case in the sense that it's, uh, it has received less attention in the empirical uh, in the existing literature. So, what we're thinking about is a setting in which, at the interim stage, now remember we are solving the uh, the game backwards. We start from the from the second period and then go uh, go back to the first period. So in the second period, when the, the asymmetric information is an issue, we're looking at a case where it is the investor making a take it or leave it offer uh, to the to the owner manager. Now in such a case, we're going to have a standard screening game where the privately informed party, who is now the the owner manager, is going to have to choose is going to have to choose a contract from uh, from what uh, from what the investor offers. And what the investor is gonna, really going to try to do is he's going to try to extract as much information rent from the privately informed party, from the owner manager, as possible. Now, what's going to be different in our game as compared to uh, to similar uh, to similar screening games is that we're going to have two types of incentives. On the one hand, there is going to be the standard incentive to understate the, uh, to, for the manager to understate his type, and on the other hand, it's going to be a countervailing incentive to overstand uh, to overstate his type. Now, this, this what I call a standard incentive. It may seem a bit surprising that uh, the owner manager is going to understate his type, but it's actually not. Um, shouldn't be actually that surprising after all. 
If you think you make an analogy to a standard monopoly pricing problem, there we have a problem that uh, the investor, who's going to be the monopolist, uh, is going to have to be faced with a problem that the consumer, who is here, the, uh, the, the owner manager, is going to understand his valuation because this will limit trend extraction. Now, over here we have something similar. The, if if, if uh, the owner manager concedes that the firm is uh, worth a lot, then uh, then the management basically then the management is uh, then, then the investor is only going to offer a very low going to offer the manager a very low participation on the future cash flows and that's going to be sufficient to make uh, the manager participate now the reason we have now an additional incentive is that if the owner manager understates his type at the same time basically if he says that look my firm, my prospects are bad my firm is bad He's also going to say that, look, also my outside option is bad. And this isn't something that he does not want to do. So you see that actually, if we think about the, uh, so, so if we here this, look at here at this equation, the left hand side is what, uh, what uh, the firm, what the manager is going to have after refinancing. And uh, the right hand side is uh, what the manager is going to have uh, without refinancing. What I've, uh, what I've, uh, what I've not uh, noted here is that refinancing in, in, after refinancing, the probability of success is much, much higher. Now, you see, it's in the standard problem, the right-hand side will be a, con a constant, whereas in this problem, the right-hand side is no longer a constant because it's gonna, it is actually type-dependent. And the fact that it's type-dependent, basically, that a good, a good firm is going to have a higher outside option, whereas a bad firm is going to have a lower outside option, now that's going to make it possible to satisfy this, uh, this equality, basically allow the investor to offer a contract that's going to extract the full information rent for each and every type. Now, if this is not, if this is not possible, we're going to end up with an underinvestment problem, such as, uh, such as uh, is typical in standard uh, monopoly pricing problems. So basically, all the investor needs to do when uh, when he often, uh, makes an offer to the uh, to the manager is think about what's going to be the contract that uh, that uh, that balances the countervailing incentives pro provided by the new round of uh, provided by the new round of financing on the one hand, and uh, provided by the uh, and provided by the initial capital structure on the other hand, that enables the, the, the that enables the investor to extract all information right for each and every type. And in terms of financial contracting, the, uh, the answer is levered equity. Now, let me give you the intuition for that. Now, if we look again at this, uh, if we look at this expression, we want, to what we want to make this equal for each and every type. Basically, that the manager's payoff with refinancing is then itself without refinancing. Now, we know that without refinancing, uh, the, the, firm, uh, the, firm, uh, the firm's prospects are not going to be that great. So actually, no matter, so, there, so the right-hand side is type-dependent, but it's, uh, on the other hand, is also not, uh, not that really dependent on whether the firm is good or bad, because without refinancing, uh, the probability of success is actually not that high. So again, the right-hand side is type-dependent, but, uh, but the manager's payoff uh, is, uh, but the, the sensitivity of the manager's payoff is only, is not that high after all on, uh, on, on his true type, which is the probability of being in the good state. So what we can do now is uh, try to make uh, the left-hand side, namely the manager's payoff after refinancing, as little sensitive to uh, as little sensitive to the manager's true type as possible. And this is best done by basically taking away by maximally taking away his participation on the upside from uh, after the new refinancing round. Now, taking the maximum away of this upside is best achieved with a levered equity contract because it gives the investor uh, the maximum participation on the upside. So basically, now we uh, so so of course this is uh, the best case scenario when uh, when we can uh, make uh, both sides equal for each and every type. If we cannot do this, the best we can do is basically try to uh, try to match uh, try to match the manager's payoff refinancing without refinancing as close as possible to his payoff after refinancing, and basically allow the in, uh, the investor to uh, extract as much information around as possible. This again, this is achieved with levered equity financing because because it gives the the investor the maximum participation on the uh, on the upside. And in fact, by giving uh, by allowing the investor to extract the maximum information rent, we also we also implementing the the most efficient possible this, uh, this uh, refinancing decision. 
Now, intuitively, the more information that uh, the investor extra extracts, basically, the higher proportion of uh, social surplus he will be in, uh, he'll be internalizing when he's solving his maximization problem, and the more efficient solution he's going to implement. So now let's go one step back. Now what I showed you before was the what I, what I was talking about uh, on the previous slides was the was the financing contract at the refinancing stage when asymmetric information is an issue. I argued that when asymmetric information is an issue, the uh, the optimal refinancing contract is going to be levered equity because it allows to uh, it allows to uh, allows the investor to extract the maximum surplus. Now, while uh, the maximum surplus, while making the expected payoff of the management as close as, close as possible to his expected payoff without re re receiving uh, an initial round, uh, without receiving a new round of financing. So when we go to the initial stage, when uh, asymmetric information is not an issue, everything is uh, all the contracts are signed under symmetric information. Then the objective of the owner manager or of the investor, if the investor is making the initial offer, will be ex actually to maximize the ex-ante firm value implying that it's going to be to, uh, to reduce uh, the interim inefficiency, which in this case is underinvestment, at least possible underinvestment if, uh, if uh, the, the previous inequality was not possible for each and every type. Then the, uh, then the question basically that uh, the owner manager will be faced with is how to boost the interim, uh, the interim countervailing incentives thereby allowing the in, uh, investor to uh, make an as efficient uh, uh, interim decision and as an efficient uh, refinancing decision as possible or uh, stated different by thereby allowing the investor to extract as much surplus at the interim stage as possible now the answer for the answer to this, to this question is to is to initially issue that now intuitively basically uh, we have uh, if we think back about when we have from that with refinancing uh, without refinancing the the manager's payoff is not very sensitive to his true type and we think it's more sensitive to true type. So basically, to make uh, the right hand side, so the, the when there is no new uh, there is no new uh, financing as sensitive as possible to the uh, to the manager's type, the manager should issue that financing, because with the, because that uh, because that uh, li limits the investor's uh, participation on the upside as much as possible, and leaves the manager as a residual claimant as much uh, as. Uh, and uh, list him to participate as much on the on the upside as possible. So let me summarize this. Uh, when we have a problem of asymmetric information in the interim stage, and the bargaining power is with uh, is with the ma with the investor instead of with the manager, it is uh, typically analyzed. Then we have a situation in which the firm should initially preserve its equity capacity, namely initially issuing debt or initially promising uh, preferred liquidation rights to the investors. And the management manager should only issue uh, only issue should uh, should then deviate to issuing equity like instruments only at later stages when uh, asymmetric information becomes an issue. Now, in the last minute uh, that I have left, uh, I want to say that we also look at the opposite case, namely when the bargaining power is with the, is not with the with the initial in, with the investors, but it's with the management. Even when there is a problem of asymmetric information. And then we're basically touching upon the standard uh, problem in the literature, where there's going to be uh, when there, there's going to be a pooling data offer offer it at, uh, at at the stage when there is asymmetric information. But again, the kind of the, there will be countervailing incentives provided incentives provided by the, by the initial uh, capital structure. Here, the incentives are going to be exactly the opposite to those that I presented on the previous slides. Namely, the management is going to have uh, the standard incentives that the manager is going to claim that his uh, that uh, his firm is uh, really re that refinancing is going to make the firm really really profitable, and then uh, the initial capital structure is going to actually going to give the counter valuing incentives to claim that the firm is actually not that great, because then this would also imply that the contracts of the initial uh, of the initial investors are actually worth a lot. So for this case, we have the opposite uh, prediction to before. We're gonna start with a we, we're gonna start with a problem of uh, we're we gonna start with a uh, with a setting where the firms are gonna initially choose uh, a lot of uh, equity financing, and they're basi basically they're gonna avoid debt financing. And they're only gonna s uh, switch to debt financing when asset formation becomes an issue. Now, unfortunately, I have time, but uh, in, uh, in the 10 seconds I have left, I'm just going to say we're looking at a model 
where we basically add an initial period and then we see that and then we discuss uh, how how the initial capital structure provides countervailing incentives and we show that uh, we're going to have different implications for financial contracting and for how firms should pre preserve their financial flexibility by differentiating between uh, whether firms have access to a competitive or non-competitive market for capital when asymmetric information is an issue. Thank you.